Now it's time to talk about binding energy. I like this picture here. Your radioactive substance has only made me stronger, Erwin. That's relating to radioactivity, but also Erwin. I have a feeling Schrodinger because that's a cat in a box. Anyway, uh, we have binding energy. This is something that's a little bit uh, unintuitive to a lot of people. You would think that when you make an atom, you need to use energy and you need to, you know, you release energy when you sort of blow things up, but it's the opposite. You release energy when a nucleus is assembled from its constituent parts, which means every time a new element is made, there's some energy that's released. That is this binding energy. And we talk about the mass of a left-hand side is not equal to the mass of the right-hand side. So what this means is this, when you have a reaction, for example, um, the main reaction inside a star, for example, is hydrogen to helium. So it's not just as simple as just, you know, two hydrogens make a helium. It's not that simple. Uh, it's a few steps process. We actually call it in astrophysics, we call it the PP cycle, like DPP. -P. Uh, we didn't mean proton, proton. So what happens is this, this is, there's a process by which uh, hydrogen can eventually turn into helium. Um, and you have one and one, and then you end up with a two, four. Obviously, this just by itself can't make it. Uh, you have to have a few different hydrogens, and you have to have the processes repeat. But basically, you end up eventually with dot, 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 helium-4. In this process, if you were to add up all, this, all the pieces to the left, for example, all the different reactions that happen in order to make this possible, if you sort of weighed you know, one of the sides, let's say the left-hand side, and then you weigh the right-hand side, all the masses before and all of it after, you'll see that they don't add up. There's a little bit missing. So that's why this is called the mass defect. This is the key thing right here. You need to know this is mass defect. Um, and this mass defect is what's important here because now we have Einstein's famous equation. If I asked you, or even your parents or someone, you know, uh, if I asked just about anybody, what's Einstein's famous equation? Most people know, e equals mc squared, right? Einstein was really clever. He also had an ability to take really complicated things and boil them down to the most beautiful of simple equations. So what this really tells you is this. This E here that we're talking about, this binding energy, that's going to be the energy released when you make a, a, a nucleus. So what happens is inside a star, remember I was explaining we have hydrogen to helium. Every time you have that uh, reaction happening, you end up with some mass that is missing, right? This is this mass defect. It turns out that mass gets converted into energy. This is the process by which it does that. E equals mc squared, which is really deep, right? Mass can turn into energy. Yep. In fact, think about a star. Think about the center of a star. What goes on, of course, every time this happens, mass gets converted to energy. Energy can be in the form of a lot of things, can't it? Including, uh, oh, I don't know, light. That's why stars are bright. Um, heat, that's why stars are hot. So, I mean, my little daughter, for example, she sings a song, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, like, done. It's a big ball of gas, right? Converting hydrogen to helium and releasing energy every time it does it. So that's this e equals mc squared. It has to do with any atom being made. So anytime you make a new element, you end up releasing some energy because some mass went missing. So let's talk about the sun. It's the binding energy. Remember, that's the released energy. And we measure energy in either electron volts or joules. And we typically use EV or MEV, mega electron volts, which is a million electron volts. We have mass, which is the mass defect, we could say. And that would be in, now, we can measure it in kilograms, of course, or we can measure it in U, which we have over here, or we could say it, it's in uh, you know, MeV per C squared. These are different units. Get it, U units? Uh, so uh, if we did the mass defect in kilograms, of course we could. Uh, and by the way, speed of light, we know that, it's just three times 10 to the eight, and it's meters per second. Now we know the speed of light. So we have this thing called an atomic mass unit, or AMU sometimes for short. That's this one U, that's this uh, on the red, in the red here. So this one atomic mass unit, what that represents, uh, I mean, you could define it, it's actually defined based on a carbon atom, um, but we can actually say this one atomic mass unit, you can, you can get it in kilograms, but I think the more useful thing is to put this in MeV per C squared. And it seems like that's a ridiculous unit. Like why would we make this atomic mass unit in mega electron volts for every C squared? What? 
But it turns out if you do a lot of physics, you realize you get really annoyed by always have to use c squared. If you think about it, you're in the middle of a calculation, like, okay, you got a mass, that's in kilograms, I got to multiply by 3 times 10 to the 8, and I got to square that. And you do it so often, you get really annoyed by it. So then it makes sense then to think, hmm, can't we have a unit that already sort of just cancels out the c squared? And it turns out this is your magic unit. This is the unit that makes your life a lot easier. And I'll show you how, because otherwise, you'd have to calculate your mass in kilograms and multiply it by c squared. Then you'd get the energy, which is would be in joules. And then you'd probably have to then convert it to electron volts, which sounds annoying. You have a lot of extra steps. So let's do a real example. So we have something called radium. And radium is uh, atomic number 88. And you're told uh, it's radium, you have 226 nucleons. Okay, so you're told it's radium 22. And it undergoes alpha decay to give radon. Now look, radium, and this is radon. So you do have to keep them straight. Radon is one with N. Radium is one with A. They both technically start with rad, don't they? They're both rad. So let's write the decay equation for this bad boy here. So what do we do? Well, we start off with this radium. So I'll put radium, uh, 88, and I'll put the 226 here. It undergoes alpha decay. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, they tell you here it gives radon, so I'll leave the Rn here, plus I need an alpha particle. Do you remember what an alpha particle is? It's a helium-4 atom, and you have to know it's 2. So do you see how this right here, then, I've got what I need? I just have to write the decay equation. Oh, I just need to fill in the numbers. So in this case right here, let's see. 88 equals what plus 2? Hopefully you can see it's 86. 86 plus 2 gives you 88, so that's that number. That's the number of protons. So that tells you radon is the 86th element on the periodic table. And then I have to have the top number here. So 226 equals what plus 4? And hopefully you can see that's 222. Because that plus 4 equals 226. So now we can call it radon 222. Now the question is how much energy is released in this reaction? And you're given the masses of radium, radon, and an alpha particle in terms of atomic mass units. This might seem annoying, but it turns out it's going to make your life easier. Let's do the right, left-hand side, and let's do the right-hand side. So the left-hand side is just this uh, radium. That's all I need. So this radium's mass is just 226.0254u. I'd say for these cases right here, be really careful. Use lots of decimals. Uh, I usually use at least four decimals here. It's one of the only sort of exceptions to sort of rounding things off. Here, leave all the decimals you can. Leave at least four uh, for these sort of questions. Now, the right-hand side, what do we have? We have radon, which is 222.0176. And we add that. Oops, I have to say it's u. That's important. You can't forget that. Uh, then we have plus an alpha particle. An alpha particle has a mass of 4.0026u. So I'll put that in. Well, then I just look at this here and say, all right, well, what's this right-hand side? Well, of course, I add these up. I end up with 226.019. Oh, no. Yeah, I end up with 226. Point, uh, what do I get? Oh, Oh, that rounds. I did a really bad job here. And it turns out it's O2. I had counted the numbers totally wrong, hadn't I? O2, O2. I just can't seem to add. I can do nuclear physics. Apparently, I just can't add. Uh, so we have this number right here, left-hand side, and we have the right-hand side. Do you notice they're not the same? They're very close, but a little bit different. So how are they different? Do the mass defect. This is the thing we need to find, is the mass defect. This is this M. And if we look at this 226.0254, if I subtract from that 226.0202, let's see, the O2 is nothing that is important. We have a 52. So we should have 0.0052U. This is the number I'm going to need. Now, of course, you could convert this. You can convert this u into kilograms and multiply it by c squared, and away you go. But let's use the easy equation. Let's use the easy version, which is just, you know, you have this e equals to m c squared. Well, then I have e, the energy released, that's this, uh, equals, let's see, the change in mass, so that would be 0 0.0052, oops, 52. And instead of u, I put in actually what a u is. And what's a u? It's 931.5 MeV per C squared. So I'm because I have this many times U. 
and u is this 931.5 MeV for every c squared. This now is u. But don't I have to multiply m times c squared? So that's why I have to throw in a c squared. Remember, this is this is the missing mass times u times c squared. So in this case, I do notice the c squareds cancel out. That's nice, isn't it? And I end up with uh, 931.5 times 0 0.0052. So I better do that on my trusty calculator. And I end up with uh, 4, let's see, 4.8438. As mega electron volts. Is this way easier? So that's why I prefer to leave things in electron volts, even though it's a unit that a lot of people get scared about. Um, leave it like this because the C squareds cancel out. That makes your life a lot easier.